We've been in a teaching on prophecy for the last uh, four years or so, and we have come to a place of, of looking at something that is a very intricate part of prophecy, and that is called the tongues of the Bible. And I'm going to put that down. Tongues is truly an intricate part of prophecy. Prophecy, it has everything to do with Israel's uh, with Israel's turning away from God and worshiping the grove, the grove, it has to do with them worshiping the grove. And of course, when you look up grove, it is the word A-S-H-E-R-A-H, Asherah, and it means upright. And they took a tree out of the forest and they cut it down and they set it upright and it is the Christ mass tree. Now, Christmas is Christ mass. And when you, and they, what they did, they dropped one of the S's, and they, it is actually two words, it's the old Anglo-Saxon, Christ, Mass, or Christus Masse, and it is the Mass of Christ, and what that is in the ancient world, Mass was eating human flesh, eating human flesh. Now, because Israel did this, God scattered them all over the face of the earth, he said, I've got four judgments. One, two, three, four. What are those? Sword, Sword famine, pestilence, pestilence. and in these four judgments, and the beast was the world ruling system. It has always been the world ruling system. It's been the world ruling system in the garden. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And of course, the word serpent is a word, it's the word N-A-C-H-A-S-H, Nakash, and that word Nakash means to enchant. It has the same meaning. Now, what people are looking for, when they're looking for a world beast system, they're looking for something totally different from what the Bible teaches. And the word dragon in the Old, in the New Testament, over there in the 12th and 13th chapters of Revelation, dragon is the word it is a word, uh, it, the word dragon, wait a minute, put, let me put uh, serpent is nakash. Serpent is nakash, and dragon is the word D-R-A-K-O-N, and that word means to fascinate, to fascinate. Now, what people are looking for, they're looking for a fire-breathing dragon. When the Bible says that the, that the, that the serpent or the dragon gave the world system, its power, its seed, and its authority, the authority of the serpent is going to be to fascinate and to make people feel good with easy words. Over there in, in, uh, in, Re in Romans 16, 17, and 18, the Bible says, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned, and avoid them because these serve not our Lord but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. They are enchanters. They are witches. Now, witch was not someone who wrote a broom. People say, I don't like it because you put down Christmas, and we think that we can make it something righteous. Christmas was pagan from the beginning, and when Constantine started the Christ Mass, this is everything that tongues is about. When Constantine started the Christ Mass, he started in 324, A.D., he started something called Roman Catholicism. He did not reach 324 years back to the birth of Christ. He reached back 2,600 years before the birth of Christ. We know that that was alive and well all through that, that 2,600 years when Israel got involved in the fire worship. He reached back to Babel and brought in the old system of Babel because the old system of Babel was nothing but a pollution of the truth. In Babel or Babylon, they worship the tree, they worship Hercules, and when you, when you look up Grove and study it, it will tell you that this is, it will be referred to, especially if you look at McClinics and Strong, they will call it the T-Y-R-I-A-N, Tyrian Venus. That's what it is, the Tyrian Venus, or when, you speak, when it speaks of Baal or Baal, Baal means the Lord the Lord, and in Babylon, or in Tyre, where that Ethbel uh, was the ruler in Tyre, now Tyre, the prince of Tyre, is equated with Satan himself, 
Tyre is right here in a place that we call Lebanon, right there, right about where Beirut is. That is the old city of Tyre. And the prince of Tyre was equated with Satan in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. Now, when he reached back here, he brought this system in. And this system had been kept alive and well by Tyre. And the Babylonian king is equated with Satan in the 14th chapter of Isaiah or Mr. Belshazzar. And what Constantine did, he brought this system into the church. This is what polluted Israel when all the systems, all the nations around Israel from 1096 B.C. all the way to the end of their kingdom in 586 B.C. when southern Judah was carried captive, northern Israel was carried captive in 722-21 B.C. over there in the 17th chapter, 2 Kings 17. 17 and 18, and southern Judah was carried captive in 2 Chronicles, the 36th chapter, 36, and it was over worshiping Baal or the Tyrian, T-Y-R-I-A-N, Tyrian Hercules. That's what he's called. That is the tree worship of the grove or Venus was represented by the tree. She was said to be upright. We are supposed to be upright before God. That's a false uprightness. And Hercules was said to be the sun god. His name was called Baal, and that was a generic term. And Hercules was one of many terms that was used to deify Nimrod in the stars. He had all the other terminologies depending on what city state you were in. He was called Tammuz over here in Babylon. He was called Atis, A-T-T-Y-S, or A-T-E-S, or A-T-Y-S, over here in what we call the ancient eastern Turkey, or western Turkey, which, which was called uh, Asia Minor in the ancient world. He had all these titles of Tammuz, uh, Adonis over here in Greece, or Achilles. He had all the various titles, and it was nothing but the deification of Nimrod. It was the reinstitution of Adam and Eve worship of the garden. Now, because Israel got involved in this, God scattered them all over the face of the earth, and he said he's going to call his people by another name, and that's what he does over there in the 65th, the 65th chapter of Isaiah, and that's what he does when he births the New Testament church over in Acts, the second chapter. So he's going to call, he's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh, and I'm going to keep saying this to remind you, God gave his spirit now, his spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth over in John. I'll write it down one, tap, one more time. John 14, 16, 17. John 15, 26. John 16 and verse 13. 1 John 5 and 6. The Bible says that the spirit is truth. And when the spirits come, he'll guide you into all truth. And he won't speak of himself. And he won't say, I've got the Holy Ghost. Do you have the Holy Ghost? Now, the Holy Spirit, he gave his spirit to one flesh. David said, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me over the 51st chapter of Isaiah. When the Bible would say that the word of the Lord came unto me saying in the book of Ezekiel, time and time again, if you, it don't matter where you turn over in Ezekiel. I haven't even prepared this, but just turn to Ezekiel. It don't matter where you go. Most of the chapters start. I just flipped over the 17th chapter. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, well, who is the word of the Lord? The Jews believed that the word was an ethereal cause or it was something in the ether around the earth that was the cause of all things. And that's why the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same that was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, the Word, and the Word was made flesh. They knew who the Word was. If you look at the 17th chapter, I just flipped over. The 18th chapter says, The Word, Jesus, came unto me, saying, God don't change. That's Jesus talking to Ezekiel. You can flip over to the next chapter. Let's see. Flip over to, uh, it's got it all through here. You can look at, uh, let's back up here and look at, you'll find it all over the book of Ezekiel. God came to Ezekiel constantly. Verse, chapter 16, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. Chapter 15, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me saying. They knew who the word was. And because, because God would come to Ezekiel and tell him, he'd say, Ezekiel, declare the judgment of God. Ezekiel was the prophet of God. 
in Babylon when they'd been carried captive because they had served these idolatrous gods. And God said, because you do this, I'm going to pour out of my spirit on all flesh, or I'm going to give my truth to all mankind, to the Gentiles, to pos, ho, whosoever, all men. And God wills that his elect will be saved from every nation, tongue, and tribe, and that is predestination. Now go back over here. This happens over here in Acts, the second chapter. This is about my 13th or 14th tape on tongues. And we're talking about this. The tongues was used to get the gospel to the all flesh. That's what it was for. It's because Israel turned away from idols. And we're going to go back through the kings, the books of the kings, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. As we go through the kings, you're going to find and watch them as they all keep turning back and turning away from Jehovah God and from his laws and his commandments. He said, if you keep my statutes and my commandments in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, he said, I will be your God, you'll be my people, your basket will be full, your womb will be full, your store will be full, but if you, and he said, you'll go against your enemy one way, they'll flee seven ways. But if you don't keep my commandments, he said, I'll send the plague on you, I'll send famine on you, I'll scatter you all over the face of the earth, and I'll put you under siege by the sword, and when I do that, I'll cause you to eat your own children. And not only did he do that, he did, it did that in a place called Tophet. Tophet, Israel made a contract with Tophet. Tophet was on the southeastern corner of Jerusalem, or south, uh, yeah, southeastern corner of Jerusalem. It was down here on the south in the valley of Hinnom. They kept the fires going, and that's where they offered their children to Moloch, and that's where they ate their children, and then they would go into Jerusalem, and they would serve Jehovah God on the Sabbath, and God said, that's how you broke my Sabbaths. They sold all their wares on the Sabbath. They offered their children and ate them and burned them in the fire. And God said, because of that, I'm going to pour out of my spirit. I'm going to blind your eyes. That's exactly what he did. Look over here in Leviticus. Not Leviticus. It starts with an L. Luke. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm allowed to say Galatians or Genesis or Leviticus or Luke. If it starts with the same or Malachi or Matthew. Now look over here in Luke. God blinds their eyes. This is the end of the 69th week of Daniel, 70 weeks from the going forth of the commandment in Nehemiah, the second chapter, until Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. That's 69 of the weeks that God said he's going to give Israel to repent. He's going to give them 70 weeks. And this is going to start in Nehemiah, this, the second chapter. Re decrees are written by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city. And from the going forth of the commandment to, re, to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. What does that mean? Messiah the Prince is Christ, who is the Prince. He is the Son of the living God. The Son of a King was called a Prince. He was a Prince to be crowned King. But when he is not crowned King, I've said this before, he would come into a city upon the young colt of an ass, and when he came into the city upon the young colt of the ass, if the people did not receive him, he would go back to his nation, get his white steed that was a stallion arrayed in battle armor, and he would come back and he would tell the people in the city, all of those of you that believe in me, come out and you know I'm your king, come out and I, he built little pavilions for them and they would watch him as they would watch him from the pavilions, take his army going and destroy the city. That's exactly what he's going to come back on a great white horse there in the 19th chapter of Revelation. Here we find it here. He's in the 29th verse of the 19th chapter of, of Luke. And it came to pass when he came nigh to Bethphage at Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples saying, Go ye into the village over against you in the which you're entering. You shall find a colt tied wherein you never... Yet never a man sat, loose him, and bring him thither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you send to him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they were sent, went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And they bring the colt back to him, and he begins to ride into the city. And look down here in verse 38. And the disciples were saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, Israel, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. God blinded their eyes. And this has to be. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to be slain as the Passover lamb. He comes in as king. He comes in on Nisan 10. Nisan, t Nisan is our month, March, April. He comes in on Nisan 10. Nisan 10 is our month, March, April. Nisan 10. Hold on, let me get me another pen. My pens ain't working. Nisan 10. And then the lamb is kept for four days. The lambs were kept in the household for four days. Nisan 10 was was kept in the house for four days till Nisan 14 and was slain on Nisan 14 and Nisan 14 was Passover. He came in as prince, prince to be crowned king. All princes are, of the fathers of their fathers are crowned king. He was Messiah the prince that day when he came in. They did not crown him king, but they took him as the Passover lamb, examined him for four days, and they would look, in, and look through the wool, and they would find if there was any blemishes or any spots or any what they called faults. We call that a fault in a dog. If you go to a dog show and there's a fault in the dog, it means it's something that keeps him from winning. Well, as they would take the Passover lambs, every family could eat a Passover lamb. They could eat anywhere from 13 to 15 people on one Passover lamb. It was a meal that everyone ate at Passover. And as they took that Passover lamb, they had to take it to the priest in the temple, and they would take the Passover lamb, they'd take it to the priest, he would thumb through it, and he would say, I find no fault in him. Then he would slit the throat, catch the blood under the, under the, uh, in a pan, and sling, sling it against the altar. Well, Pilate's words were put into his mouth by the living God. That's called predestination, God's sovereignty. And when, when Passover would come, they, at that time Christ was taken at that Passover lamb. He was Messiah the Prince. And the eyes of the Jews were blinded, and he's going to pour out of his truth on the Gentiles in the second chapter of Acts, and he's going to use the tongues to do it with. Now, the tongues is the whole purpose of, of God pouring out of his truth on the Gentiles. There's two words for tongue in the New Testament. Let me write them down one more time. We've got them on this. We've got them on the, if everybody doesn't have a copy of this, we'll give you a copy. But I've got a study sheet on tongues. This ain't got nothing to do with Pentecostalism. All the Baptists I was raised in, my father was a Baptist preacher. My grandfather was a Methodist preacher. My great-grandfather was a Baptist preacher. And I come from a long line of preachers, and none of them really... I don't believe I understood this. Now, because the reason the Baptists don't teach on Acts is because they think if they teach on the first part, they have to become a Pentecostal. If they get to Acts 2.38, they have to become a Church of Christ. So they leave it alone, don't they? That's what they do. Now, two words for tongue. One is the word glossa. We get the word G-L-O-S-S-A-R-Y. That word glossary means foreign. Oh. Wait a minute. Foreign language. Well, glossary means foreign language. A glossary is a difficult section in a book that explains difficult words in that book. You have a glossary in there. And we have the word D-I-A-L-E-K-T-O-S. Dialectos. And the di they had a dialect of every one of the languages of the world in that day and time. I've got my, let me read this to you again if I can find it. I had it here. I got more papers than y'all got. Y'all can probably find it easier than I can. But they had a dialect. They had an international, what they called, Koine language. They had an international language. Does one of y'all have that? I can read that. Wait a minute. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Yeah, Patois. I'm going to read this again because people need to know this. 
before I read it, let's go over here to Acts 2 and we'll read it again. You had dialectos, that meant a dialect. It meant a dialect. A dialect is where that you have a certain idioms, certain shaping of words for a certain area of the country. Let me read this one more time. These dialects were dialects and these glossa were glossa of the koine. Koine. Koine means common. We get our word communions. We get the word K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. Koinonia. That means communion. And that word koine meant common. They had a common language for all the world. Let me read it one more time. The koine, the spread of the koine, or common Greek tongue to serve special mention. This comes out of Mr. Mr. Angus, Samuel Angus, Mr. Religions. He wrote this in the mid-1920s before Pentecostalism had taken hold. Let me read it to you one more time. The koine, the special, the spread of the koine or common Greek tongue to serve special mention as a potent factor in the religious propaganda of the following centuries. Before Alexander's day, Athens had chiseled for herself her dialect into that classic perfection which is the wonder of students, but Greece never had a uniform national language. We were under a Grecian culture back in that day and time. That was because Alexander the Great in the 4th century B.C. set up this Greek culture in this international Greek language. Each separate city-state, Jerusalem, Antioch, when you went into a different city-state, they had a different what he says here, each separate city-state had its own patois, P-A-T-O-I-S, P-A-T-O-I-S. And that means a dialect. It's pronounced P-A-T-W-A. That is a French word. He said they all had their own dialect or patois, which in most cases, which in most cases was as distinct from that of its neighbor a couple of leagues distance as are Spanish and Italian. They differed that much. When Jesus told the apostles, go into all the world, these were ignorant Galileans from northern Israel. They didn't know what to do. They said, what? Well, God, if you're going to send us into all the world to preach the gospel, you're going to have to give us an understanding of this because we don't know how to get the message over. He goes on to say the term Hellas, well, Hellas was another term for Greece, never became a national or linguistic unity, the chief bond of union being a more or less Catholic religion. And he uses that in the true sense of Catholic. Catholic means universal. While there was no uniform language in Greek which could converse with Greek, it was impossible for Greece to exercise her intellectual hege hegemony, and that means leadership or domination. And if a man must learn a dozen Greek patois or dialects and half a dozen Oriental tongues before he could travel and exchange ideas with men of other races, he would prefer to remain at home. It was too hard. And I said this before. When we find Lydia over in the 16th chapter of Acts meeting Paul on a creek bank up here at Philippi, Lydia was from over here in Asia Minor, and Lydia was a seller of purple, and purple was sold to rich people only because it took so many of the mollusks here off of the coast of, of, uh, all of the coast of Lebanon. It took so many of those mollusks, just get a little drop out of the gland of the purple out of one of the mollusks, and it took so many of them that you had to be rich to wear purple. It was against the law for slaves and poor people to wear purple. So when Lydia was over there at Philippi, she had to know many languages. She had to be very bright, very intelligent, and she had a very good job when she laid it all on the line for Paul and for Silas when they were thrown into the Philippian jail in the 16th chapter of Acts. Now, you could not understand in those areas. That's why there had to be, there had to be a miracle from God for the people to hear. Now, here in Acts 2, one more time. I'm going to give you this quick, and I want to go straight to the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. We've already covered this, but I'm just going to hit, hit it very quickly. And I'm not going to explain all of it in the detail. I've got 13 tapes where I've got this thing hammered down. Now, so if you want the rest of it, you'll have to come and, and ask me for it. 
Here in verse 3, and they appear, there appeared unto them, they were all gathered together in one place, and there, there came from uh, sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind in verse 2, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, I haven't mentioned this yet. Baptism does not mean to dip into. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. And he says, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now, we said this, we said this uh, Wednesday night, and I'm going to bring this out, so I want to show you something. In verse, in verse 4 of chapter 1, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Originally, baptized was not a verb. Baptized was a noun. It is called an infinitive. An infinitive is a verbal noun, and the movement is not on the part of the subject, the movement is on the part of the fluid. Over there in Acts 10, when, the, when uh, Peter said, he told the people at the house of Cornelius, he said, be baptized in the name. Well, that word baptized is not a verb. And it's, it's an infinitive, and nouns do not show movement. When it's an infinitive, movement is taken upon the noun. If you... If you baptized a barn, you wouldn't lift the barn up and dip it into... I'm sorry, but that's not what the word means. It's an infinitive. And whether people like that or not, they say, well, you just sound like a cult to me. We need to cast those infinitives out of you. Well, let's go get the high school teacher and all the professors at these college and throw them out and say, y'all got demons in you. You talk about verbs and adverbs and adjectives and infinities and participles and pregnant nominatives, and we got to get these demons out of you. That is so stupid. Whether you like it or not, if you come out here, I'll show it to you. And you Greek teachers know what I'm talking about. You know I'm telling the truth. They're not going to even deal with you on it. So, if you notice that they're baptized at Pentecost in the second verse, did you notice this? The mighty wind filled the house, and they were sitting in the house. They were baptized, weren't they? Did, they didn't. Uh, that they wasn't over there picking each other up going, hey, there comes the Holy Spirit. Hey, I baptize you. That's not what they were doing, were they? No, the house, the house was filled where they were sitting. They were baptized sitting down. <laughs> Weren't they? Does that mean we're supposed to pick people up in chairs and dip them into something? Besides that, when we're baptized into his death, his death was a cross. That's a baptism. A blood baptism was considered a death. And Jesus wasn't put into a ground. I was raised a Baptist. I was ordained a Southern Baptist church. And you Baptists pay close attention. They didn't bury him in the ground. That's the wrong picture. They buried him, they buried him in tombs in the side of a mountain. So you're going to have to get you, if, you, if you're going to do it in water, you've got to get you a wall of water and pick and get a real strong guy. Get Art that comes over. He's a great big strong guy. And get him to dip you up into it. Because they buried him inside of mountains and tombs. They didn't put him six feet under like we do. So saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And bringing him up. That ain't baptism. I'm not sorry to tell you that. It's a blood baptism. If it was one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it's either blood or it's water. And he's washed us from our sins in his own blood. And babto, babto which is the infinitive means to cover all over with a stain or dye. I have never seen anybody stained or dyed with H2O unless you put food dye in it. If you want to do that, maybe that'll work. Put a bunch of red food dye. Now, verse 3. They appeared unto them cloven glossa, like as a fire, and sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What were they filled with? Truth. Why? Because Israel was blinded and God wasn't going to call them anymore. They're not all Israel which are of Israel. Only the election hath obtained what Israel seeketh for, and the rest were blinded. And they were all filled with the truth and began to speak with other heteroglossa as the Spirit which was in them and had baptized them as they were sitting down. I'm going to say that. Gave them utterance. Now, that word utterance don't mean to go, 
It don't mean guttural sounds. One more time. The word utterance, A-P-O, P-H. How do you pronounce that, Jim? <laughs> I like for him to say it because he did that on some of the announcements. A-P-O-P-H-T-H-E-G-G-O-M-A-I, apophathengomai, you pronounce two G's in G. It means to enunciate clearly, so clearly as to be easily understood. It does not mean to say guttural sounds. In fact, it's the same word there. It's the same word in verse 14. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said. The word said is apophathengomai. It's the same word over there when Paul is talking to, to uh, in the 26th chapter, when Paul is talking to Festus, when he says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth. Speak forth is the word I'll for thing of mine. Speak forth the words of truth. Now, you don't speak forth truth by going, Mumble, that's <laughs> That ain't it. You say, Jim, you make fun of that. Somebody needs to tell those people they're full of themselves. And you people who have been fooled, get out of that. If you're a believer, don't do it anymore. Because what they're doing is totally untrue. But speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He said, these are not drunk, they're sober. Isn't it funny, that stupid Rodney Howard Brown calls himself a, he says he is a Holy Ghost bartender. He says, they are not drunk. It's but the third hour of the day. It's nine o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. And then you've got the other word tongue up here. Now you've got to remember Exodus 33. There were three days that all the males of the world that were Jews had to come back to Jerusalem. Three days. They had to come back for Passover. They had to come and they had the feast of first fruits lasted from Passover. Fifty days later came Pentecost. Pent means five. Pentecost means 50th. They came back 50 days later to Pentecost and they had to come back to the Day of Atonement, which was connected with the Day of Tabernacles, with the Feast of Tabernacles. These are the three, and all the males were required to come back. These were the Jews of the Diaspora. These are the Jews that had been scattered by Sennacherib because of their apostasy and serving idols, worshiping Venus and Hercules. When Jezebel had married Ahab in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, these are the these are the Jews that were dispersed and scattered all over the face of the earth in the 17th and the 18th chapter of 2 Kings. These are the Jews of southern Judah that had been scattered and were still in captivity all over the civil island world, living in various nations, speaking the Koine or the Patois or the dialects of those nations, the dialects of the Greek language. That's what they were. And let's read it here. In verse 6, now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. But the word language is dialectos. Right here. It was a dialect of the Greek language. It was not shandalakandai. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Aren't these a bunch of ignorant half-breeds? That's what they were saying. How can they be doing this? They are uneducated. I know that Peter there, I heard that he was a fisherman with that James and that John and Matthew. That guy Matthew was a tax collector and everybody hated him. If he had had an education, he wouldn't have the most hated job in Israel. These guys aren't educated. How are they speaking? Well, what's, here's what they said. How here we every man in our own dialect when we were born, Parthian Jews, Medes Jews, Edomite Jews, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, that's the, this Mesopotamian valley down here, the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Asia, Cappadocia is up here just in northern Turkey up under the Black Sea, right in that area, area there. 
These were Libyan Jews. They were Phrygian Jews, Pamphylian Jews, Egyptian Jews, and parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, those who had converted to Judaism. Cretes and Arabian Jews, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, let me tell you something. Peter didn't believe that there were any Gentiles here because if he did, he would not have stood up and preached. Mr. Edersheim says there were probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three million Jews in this little bitty town of Jerusalem here at this Pentecost and at this Passover. Three million. And only 3,000 people say, well, there was a lot of them saved, 3,000. That's a very small percentage of three million. Yep. Yeah. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? And others mocking said, these men are full of new wine, but Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. These are not drunk, Rodney Howard. Goofball, I want him to change his last name. I don't want him having the same name as mine. For these are not drunk. Paul said, I speak forth. Apophathangomai. They would speak as the Spirit gave them apophathangomai to enunciate clearly in the glossa and they would hear in the dialects where they were born. And the whole purpose of it was the pouring out of his truth on red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh. We need only given his truth to one flesh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And he had 12 sons. Only that flesh is the only flesh he gave his truth to from Abraham until Christ. And they got involved in idolatrous worship. And God said, I'll scatter you all over the face of the earth. And he said, I'm going to call my people by another name. And it will be the Gentile church. I'm going to give my truth to all flesh by the method of the tongues. Because you've been involved in this idolatrous worship. And all the time Israel was a nation. It's all about the land of Israel. So he scattered them. And now he's going to call his Israel by another name. And this is that. He says, but this is that. And I want to keep reminding you of this. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Now, where, they, where the Pentecostals come up with this last days, well, they say, you're going to have to, one thing you're going to have to get out of your head, and I have to get it out of my head. The last days is not the last 100 years, 150 years or 75 years. First of all, because the last days are right here in Acts 2, aren't they? They're here right here. <coughs> if Joel said, here's something that's going to happen in the last days. I'm going to pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And Peter said, here it is right here at Pentecost. This is it. Wait a minute. Acts 2, you can... My pens are going crazy on me. In Acts 2, you can just put Acts 2. Acts 2. Last days are here. And last, by definition, would mean there was some first days. Now, all the rabbis said and that, from, that, from, that from Adam... And I understand that some of the generations are skipped, but the way God counts, God counts the way he wants to count. He counts in the Bible four days, four days, or 4,000 years. Or 4,000 years. A day is with the Lord is 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is one day in 2 Peter 3 and 8. And, he, and David said, 1,000 years is but yesterday in thy sight. A day is with God is 1,000 years, so if you had four days from Adam to Christ and you had two days or 2,000 years during the last days is the times of the Gentiles when he's going to pour out of his spirit to the end of time and he blinds the eyes of the Jews. This is the time of the Gentiles or the time of all men when he's going to give his truth to all men. And he had never given his truth to all men for the first four days. He only had one lineage from Seth you can trace Seth all the way down to, to Noah, all the way to Shem. Shem lived, about, Shem lived about 250 years before Abraham. 
I believe Shem was held the office of Melchizedek, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's the only flesh that received his truth until Acts 2, and then the Gentiles are all men or all flesh, otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight. We are the all flesh. There ain't no literal Jews here, are there? Well, are you got some Jew? Uh-oh. Are you better than the rest of us? <laughs> I just wondered. No, we know that's not true. I just thought I'd ask you that. <laughs> but see, without the all flesh means me. I'm a 100% bona fide Assyrian Gentile. <laughs> and Larry is a Babylonian. And uh, that's what he is. That's what Calvin is, is a Babylonian. That's what, that's what Steve is, Babylonians. And we are Assyrians. And believe it or not, the Assyrians were the worst. The Assyrian Caucasians were the most barbaric people that ever existed. And they try to lift themselves up above the other races. If anything, everybody else should be persecuting them for what they have done in history. Isn't it amazing? Because Israel turned away from God. He, the, first, the first carrying away was by some Assyrians. And they carried him up here into the Caucasus Mountains. And isn't it amazing? He used an Assyrian called Adolf Hitler to be the last sword to cut him down one last time. And then he destroyed Hitler. Isn't that amazing? He used Assyrians. He started with Caucasians and he ended it with Caucasians. Whew. If there's anything, and it's not flesh that we're proud. You can't be proud of flesh, black or white. We're all sinners is what we are. Now, now where was I? Oh, yeah, last days. The last days were here. They were there. In Eschatos, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S. It comes from the word echo, E-C-H-O. -E and it means the last in a series. God's got a series. It's the same word that's used that will be changed at the last trump. There's not going to be a trumpet sound at the beginning of the tribulation and then one sound at the end of the tribulation. After the tribulation, those days over there in, in Matthew 24, 29 through 31, after the tribulation, those days, the Lord shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Well, the last one doesn't sound at the beginning of the tribulation. And this eschatos means the last in a series. So the last days would be the last two days or the last 2,000 years, and we know that it was here. Now, what the Pentecostals do, in 1904, 1906, out in Galena, Kansas, Joplin, Missouri, that thing started, the tongue speaking, some woman started jabbering, and they said, oh, the last days are here. God's pouring out of his jabbering on all flesh. No, 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 no. No, it's to enunciate clearly with dialects and foreign languages, and it was the method of getting God's truth to the all flesh or all men or the Gentiles. Besides that, Assyrians and Babylonians were interchangeable names. Black and white was considered the same race in the ancient world. <laughs> How do you like those apples? <laughs> Isn't that good? Bunch of moon worshippers, that's it. Now, yes. In fact, sometimes the word Assyrian and Babylonian mean the same thing, and they interchange them in the Old Testament. You think they're what? Babbling? That's exactly right. Oh, you said talking like he's down to seen my mother, got grandmother. And she said, Yeah, I didn't know what she said in that front of them drinking that moonshine. Huh? <laughs> and sometimes I listen to these little kids and I'm going, What? And if you go up to New York, somewhere way up north of New York, I told this before, I used to tour with uh, my singing group, and I went up to New York. I was way up northern New York, and I got lost on some road, and I stopped on some dirt road, and I was asking this guy, and he sounded like he was talking Swedish or German or something, but he was talking English. I'd ask him a question. He'd say, oh, when he's up in song, he'd say, yeah, come song. And I was, what? I kept saying, what? What? Could you talk so What? It was funny. It really was funny. Finally, I just turned around and got it back in my van. I said, let's go. I, I'm going to go somewhere and ask somebody else. I can't understand a word this guy said. And I really couldn't. But, see, theirs were worse than that, their dialects. Their dialects differed as much as French and Spanish would differ. It, the, the, even some of the letters were so totally different, they couldn't figure out what was being said. Now, now let, me, let me bring something out to you 
to. I've got to bring this out to you. People say, well, over there in the 19th chapter of Acts, the Bible says that there's a second work of grace. Turn to the 19th chapter. Let me show you this. 19. Now, now here, let's read this because I've got to straighten this out for you. There is no second work of grace. And it came to pass, verse 1, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Sounds like a second work of grace, doesn't it? Huh? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now, what that says in the interlinear says, Believing, did you receive the Holy Ghost? Believing, upon your believing, did you receive? That's what it says in the interlinear. It did not say since. Or, at, at, we use that word since in that text. We use that word, we say since you've already gone to the store, did you get some bread? It didn't mean, did you get some bread since you left the store, does it? Did you, since you've gone to the store, did you buy some bread somewhere along the way? Did you stop at somebody's house and buy some bread? No, since you went to the store, did you get some bread? Well, see, we use the same. What they did, they translated it that way, but it says, believing did you receive? And they'll use this verse, the Pentecostal will use this second verse, to say, see, there is a second work of, grace, work of grace. No, that ain't what it says in the original text. It says, believing, did you receive? Now that one I've heard. Huh? I've heard that one. You've heard him use that since you, were, since you know a bunch of Pentecostals. No, it doesn't, it doesn't say that in the original text. Now I want us to go over here. I want us to hit some of the things, and if you've got your, I want you to get your, your tongues thing here. Now, the tongues were for one reason. That was to get the message of the truth to the all flesh, to the all men during the last days or during the last 2,000 years, the times of the Gentiles, and that's the times where the Gentiles, it's a twofold thing. The Bible says that the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword in Luke 21 and 24. They'll fall by this edge of the sword. They'll be led away captive into all nations until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the times of the Gentiles is a twofold picture. It has to do with the Gentile elect church and at the end of time or at the end of the last days, the Gentiles' eyes are going to be blinded and the Jews' eyes, they're going to go back. The literal Jew, but a Jew is not a Jew out of but the heart. And the Jews are going to have to join us in the church. And it's not a literal temple that's where they're going to stop the sacrifice and the oblation. If I get a chance, we'll get to that tonight. It's in these bodies where they're going to stop the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, I want us to go here to, to act. The only way I know to do it is let's go over here to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. We've talked about this in Acts 2 over and over. We're not afraid of Acts 2. We love Acts 2 around here. But we don't believe in speaking in Pentecostal tongues of the 1990s and 1980s and 70s and 60s because the last days did not start in 1904, 1906 out in Kansas and then move out to Azusa Street. That ain't it. They were here at Pentecost. What I want to know is where did all this jabbering go for 2,000 years till 1904? Huh? Where did the Spirit go? In the last days, he's going to pour out of his Spirit on all flesh. Now, let's go to 14. 14. And we're going to cover some of this because I want you to see some of these things. Now, let's read here in verse 1 of chapter 14. 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at 14 and see what the tongues means here. We've already talked about some of it, the, the last portions. But let's read the first verse. Follow after charity. Charity, the charity chapter is the previous chapter. There's not one word of commendation to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. They've started off, Paul said, I have to feed you with milk in the third chapter because you're not able to endure meat. You're not grown up. You cannot endure what was called stereos, S-T-E-R-E-O-S, and that comes from the word S-T-A-U-R-O-S, staros, that word stereos means strong meat. It means being of full age, full age. Now, when a person is of full age, they cannot, 
They cannot endure the strong meat, and the word staros is the word cross. They are not able to be grown up and to crucify themselves. That's what Paul said about the Corinthians. He said, you're arguing over who you're following who you're following, and all the way through, he reprimands them, and he's reprimanding them still here. He tells them the best way for them to follow in the second chapter, in the 13th chapter, is charity. The word charity is the word A-G-A-P-E, agape. Agape is, is the common word for love in the New Testament. You've got two words that have been ambiguously translated, P-H-I-L-E-O, phileo. And he says in that first chapter, in the 13th chapter, the first verse, though I speak with the glossa, the foreign languages of men and of angels, and there was one man that really knew foreign languages better than anybody else in the New Testament. That was the Apostle Paul. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. That was his teacher. He was a brilliant, intelligent man. And he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of Angelos, messengers of God, though I am a messenger of God to you, and, and of angels, and have not charity. Charity is agape. Agape was an old ancient term. Every time the Bible says love your neighbor, love your enemy, God is love, it's always agape. It is never phileo. Phileo means to have affection. And inevitably, if you watch... Geraldo or Oprah or Donahue when he was on, and some Christian will stand up and say, we're not supposed to be doing this uh, homosexuality. Somebody will say, oh, you have a hatred and you're homophobic. Well, then I guess God was homophobic. You're not afraid of homosexuality. Homosexuals don't need to repent of homosexuality. They need to repent if they're elect. If they're not elect, they are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So go ahead and do what you want to do. It doesn't matter. If you can hear this message, you will hear it. And you have, they need to repent. That's all. Homosexuality is not the worst sin. It's one of the many sins, but it is sin. It's no worse than adultery. And it's no worse than other sins of pride and self and lifting oneself up. God will kill you and send you hell for being a proud, proud Baptist deacon. I got to give them a fit. I got to say one word on them before I get through this. I give Baptists a hard time because I was raised in a Baptist church, and I'm, I'm fed up with them. I'm sick of them because they won't tell the truth. They're the laziest bunch of bums. I know they won't study their Bibles. And they, I promise you, I was raised in an independent Baptist church as ordained a Southern Baptist, and they are scared to death of Acts 2. If all they got to do is define words and study all the Old Testament history, and they'll understand it. It sounds easy, doesn't it? Now, agape was an old ancient term. It meant to walk in the commandments of a king in a kingdom or a father in a family. That's what it meant. When you love your neighbor, you walk in truth in front of them. And when God says separate from them and don't bid them God's speed and don't be cheerful to them and show them no affection, that's also loving them. It doesn't mean to flail them. Now, he says, follow after walking in the commandments of God. Despite, desire spiritual. He told them they were carnal. The word gift is not in the text. And we studied the gifts of God or the spiritual. He, he says this in re reference to 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, now concerning spiritual. He kept reprimanding them all the way through the 11th chapter for their carnality and their living in sin. And he said everybody's got a place in the body of Christ. Desire to do that spiritual thing in the body of Christ that he has given you an ability to do. It's not something you seek after. It's something he's already set. Whatever talent you have, Glenn's got the talent doing all this, all of these electrical things back here and putting all these tapes together and being able to produce them and put all those, uh, the character generator and putting all these down and getting them right down to the second. He will get another machine and he'll get in here and look at the, he, he's got the talent of being able to read those manuals and come out and learn how to do this exactly. But don't hand me a parsing guide. Don't hand him a parsing guide. Yeah. But I, and I love to study the Greek, but I don't want to go back there and do that. Some people are able to fix cars, and they can help the poor and the needy and the downtrodden by helping repair their cars. Some people, you can do whatever you can do. That's the spiritual. And I'm not going to go through that. Let's go on here. He says, but rather that ye may... 
prophesy. You mean, yea, I say unto thee, if thou wilt be my people, I will be thy God, and thou shalt follow after me, and I will give unto thee all the things that thine heart shall desire, and I will be unto thee. Good, great, no. I hate that. Let me write this down. It's the word P-R-O-P-H-E-T-E-U-O. P-R-O. P-H-E-T-E-U-O. Prophetuo. That word prophetuo comes from the word, it's related to the word prophetia. It means to foretell events or speak under the inspiration of God. How about his word? All scripture is given by inspiration from God. All scripture, all graphe, all writings, all etchings of God are given by inspiration from God and are profitable. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. Here's the inspiration of God right here. And he says, he says that you may speak the word of God is what he's talking about. Not merely just seeking an ability to do something, but speaking the truth. You see, he's saying, follow after charity and desire spiritual or whatever your place in the church is. But the main thing he's saying is preach the truth to people. Me and Teresa was talking about that before we started. Speak the truth and do it twice. And after the second admonition, Titus 3.10 says, reject them if they won't hear because they subvert their own house and they're heretics. For he that speaketh in an unknown, notice the word unknown isn't there. It's implied. He that speaketh in a glossa, it's not unknown to the man who's speaking it. It's unknown to the people hearing. Now, there's something you need to understand about Corinth. Corinth was the very seat of all debauchery. It was right down here in Greece. It was the seat of all licentious, lascivious living, and all of the world lived around the hub of Corinth is where they lived. All the sailors from all over the world, all the traders, all the merchants, they had dozens and dozens and dozens of dialects in the street. They had all kinds of, to call a man a Corinthian was tantamount to calling him a drunk. So you have to understand that there was a lot of stuff going on in this church that God is not lifting them up. He's condemning. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, if you're in church there at Corinth, don't bring your dialect or your gloss in and think you have something to say. I'd like to stand up and I'd like to give some kind of testimony and I speak Spanish and there ain't nobody here that speaks Spanish. Now, Mike speaks three languages. He's sitting back there somewhere. Mike speaks German. He was raised in Germany until he was 10. He speaks some Spanish and he speaks very little English. <laughs> He's very shy when he gets to the English. And it sounds like we have a Nazi in the den when he's talking to his grandmother in Germany. Now, if Mike comes down here and starts saying things, I doubt if anybody else here can understand what he's saying in German, right? No. That's what it's talking about. Don't stand up. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. Well, what's he used to talking? Do you think you need to tell God something? Jim, Jim are you saying the person speaking in the tongue no, no, he does understand it. Sure he does. I mean, Mike understands German. If Mike starts talking to German, he understands German. No, no, but it's only, it, only the way, it says he that speaketh in a tongue unknown is not in the text. He that speaks in a foreign language is what it says. He that speaks in a glossa. In a foreign language, he doesn't talk to men but unto God, and God sure does need your instruction, doesn't he? For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Well, we ain't supposed to be keeping mysteries from the elect. We are to speak. How are we to speak? Second, Second Corinthians 3.12, seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Dad, coming? <laughs> plainness. Here it is. Let me erase this. We use great plainness. P-A-R-H-E-S-S-I-A. Or P-A-R-H-E-S-I-A, I believe it is. P-A-R-H-E-S-S-I-A. P-A-R-H-E-S-S-I-A. Parhesia. And it comes from pos, meaning all, and E-R-E-O, a rail, 
That word arrayal means the commandment. And what this means, this means to be blunt, straight to the point. Don't beat around the bush. Be cutting. Don't circumvent and talk around something. Don't make a circle around. This means be pointed and blunt. How be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. We are not ever told to speak in mysteries. This book is an indictment against Corinth. They're not doing anything right. God has to reprimand them about that man in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians who's having an affair with his stepmother. And Paul is saying, separate from that man. They separate from him. And then in the second chapter of 2 Corinthians, they don't want to forgive him <laughs> after he repents. And he says, repent. This man's going to sorrow with an excessive sorrow. Don't keep doing that to him. He's repented. Forgive him. He's going to live right. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification. What is he saying here? He's saying in the, the, the ones who are speaking mysteries, don't edify men. Is that what he's saying? Now, the word edify, what is that word? Oikodomeo. O-I-K-O. D-O-M-E-O. Oikodomeo. It comes from O-I-K-O-S. That is the word house. And D-O-M-E, dome, or we say dome, it means house roof. And when you finish the roof on a house, you finish the house of God. Back to 1 Corinthians 8, chapter, one more time. Here's what he says. What is it that builds up the house of God? Telling a man the truth. That's what it does. And walking in truth in front of him. 1 Corinthians 8 and 1. Now as touching things offered to idols. I'm going to go through this probably next Sunday morning. Mike asked me about this the other night, but I'm not going to go through offering things to idols. We're going to go through the 8th and the 10th chapter and the 2nd chapter of Revelation next Sunday morning on things offered to idols and what it's talking about. We know that we have knowledge, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. We know that we have science and understanding and an exactness of the Word of God, but knowledge puffs up if you don't walk in truth. If all you've got is knowledge... And you stand at this, this verse right here is a corresponding verse to verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13 when he said, if we have not charity, we become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And he said, though I have understand all the mysteries and all knowledge and I, can and I can remove mountains and have not charity, I have not walking in his commandments, I have not agape, I am nothing. Everything I'm doing is worthless if I don't do what I know. Truth is not something you assent to mentally. Truth is something you do. And what you believe is what you do. He that doeth truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they're wrought in God. And what you do is what you believe. Don't tell me you believe the truth and you don't do it. Because faith cometh by hearing. I have faith. I believe. Faith is the, ver is the noun. Believe is the verb. Faith cometh by hearing, and hear and obey are the same word in the Greek and the Hebrew. What you do is what you obey. That's what you believe. Somebody says, I believe in predestination. Not if you're not conforming, you don't. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. And if you're not conforming, you're not obeying the word of God, you don't believe it. I don't care what you, what you assent to mentally. You say, I believe the truth. Separate from men who walk disorderly. Separate from those people who won't tell the truth. And don't support ever a church that preaches free will. If free will is true, I'm preaching a lie. If I'm preaching truth, they lie. Now, let's read on here. He says here, in chapter 8 and verse 1, as touching things offered to idols, we know that we have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. Just to have knowledge is what he's saying. If all you have is knowledge and you won't walk in the knowledge you know, then you're puffed up. But charity edifieth. Charity is having the knowledge and doing it. Because charity is agape, and agape is what edifies and builds up the house of God. And what is the house of God? Hebrews 3 and 6. If Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we? So the house of God is built up by agape. It's knowing the truth and doing it. Just knowing the truth and not doing it, that's arrogant. 
That's puffs you up. That's what he's talking about right here. Knowledge puffs up, but charity, agape, walking in the commandments. Now, you can't walk in the commandments of God unless you have the knowledge of them. So the charity is knowing and doing. And knowledge is just something. Say, I got it up here. I know predestination, but right now I've got some things to live for. And there's some people that's come through here that said that. You don't believe in predestination until you're doing it. And what you do is what, what you're obeying is what you believe. Believe in faith. Same word. Faith comes by hearing or faith comes by obedience. So what you believe is what you're doing. So charity edifies. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14 now. Then he says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, well, let's back up to verse 3. He that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Don't speak mysteries in an unknown tongue that nobody or in a confusion of tongues. And that's what these preachers are preaching in a confusion of tongues up here at the big Baptist churches and the big churches of Christ. And nobody understands anything because they don't define anything and they don't have any knowledge of what anything means. They don't even know what dialects and glossa are. Then he says, verse 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. The Bible, that's an indictment against a man. We're to edify others and the church never sell. That's not a, in Charismatics and Pentecostals, read that, see, edifies himself. He builds up himself. Yeah. Where'd you ever get that that is a commendation from God? That is a condemnation. We are never told to edify self. We're told to edify the body of Christ. Notice he'll give a negative, then he'll give a positive. He'll give you a negative and say, they speak mysteries, but the man who prophesies and speaks the word of God, he edifies and builds up the house of God, but the man who speaks in an unknown tongue, he builds himself up. But he that prophesies edifies the church. Doesn't it look like he's got an antithesis here? He's got two opposites. He's got two things in juxtaposition. Whatever that means. <laughs> juxtaposition means complete opposites. Edifying self is in complete opposition to prophesying and speaking God. The word prophesy does not mean necessarily. It just means to speak for another is what it means. Now let's read on here. I would that all spake with glossa. Why? Well, because we got this whole system all over the world that's a tongues, glossa, dialect system, and in order to get the message out, we need more people that are able to translate into other languages. He said, I would that all spake with glossa, but rather that you prophesied and you really knew the truth. If you're going to really know the truth, you're going to have to tell it. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Now, if you're going to prophesy, you're going to tell the word of God. You're not simply going to have a language that you understand that you can go out there and talk to other people. There's a purpose for this glossa. Except he interpret. See, it's okay to speak with the tongues, but he's saying don't speak with unknown tongues if you're going to speak with glossa, speak the word of God and have it interpreted so they'll know. And why was that necessary? Because Corinth had dozens of languages that the church may receive edifying. What does it say? Not that self may receive edifying. Isn't that what it says? If that's in opposition of the man who speaks in an unknown tongue, lifts up himself in verse 4, he edifies himself. This is a condemnation is what it is of Corinth. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with glossa, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? I believe that word doctrine is the word didascalia. Yeah, it's the word didache. 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 It's the word D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Boy, these pens are going out on me. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. Hold on. Here it is. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. That means instruction. If I don't instruct you, what good am I doing getting up here and say, como esta? 
Yeah, that's about all I know. Come on, stow stead. Would be eight. Hmm? Huh? Ghost burrito. Burrito what? Ghost burritos. Ghost burritos. <laughs> so if I can if you don't know anything about Spanish, you won't know that I said how are you, will you? No. That's what he's talking about. Now, let's read on it. He says, he that speaketh with the tongue, sh he, where am I? Okay. Now, brethren, verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with glossa, what shall I profit you except I speak unto you by revelation? Now, you remember he said these guys were speaking in a mystery. The word revelation is, is apocalypse or apocalypsis. Apo, it comes from apo and calupto, A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-T-O. It's actually word A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. -I, I believe that's the word, isn't it, Sid? S-E-I. Huh? Well, S-E-I. That, that's the, we're not going to go into the word endings. Apocalypsis, and that means to remove the cover. Now, he says up here in verse 2, the man who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks mysteries. And he says he that speaks in an unknown tongue in verse 4 is lifting up himself. But he says, if I'm not able to instruct you and somebody's not interpreting this, I'm not doing any good. Isn't that what he's saying? And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in sounds, how shall it know, be known what is piped or harped? And if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? Now, if you don't know what reveille is, and you're in the army, you better find out what it is. That means it's time to get up and meet formation. And we know that when, when you have to, when you go to bed at night and you're in the military, you have something called taps. That means go to sleep. It's your bedtime. You see, even a trumpet can tell you what he's saying and what the instructions are. He said, what good is it doing talking in tongues? You're going to lift yourself up and you're only talking to God and he don't need your instruction. So likewise, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. Isn't it funny how Baptists are scared of this chapter? Yeah, they're not talking to anybody. Yeah, because back then they were speaking in the corne of uh, Antioch. And nobody was there that knew the corne of Antioch. So unless you speak by the gloss of words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. You're just running your mouth. Huh? Talking to yourself. You're talking to yourself. That's all going on. Just talking to the air, and God can hear and says, Look, boy, I don't need you talking to me. Get a, have an interpreter or don't do it at all. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. I hadn't looked up that word signify. I need to I wonder if I could do that real quick real quick. Mm -hmm. Signification. Do you have that word? Huh? None of them were without. Huh? Let's do this. We ain't never done this on camera, have we? S I G N. Now see, signify. S I G. Hold on, signification. I'll get it. All right, signification. None of them without signification. What he's saying, signification. Eight eighty. Eight eighty. Here it is, right here. Eight. Eight eighty. This is the way. Now this is the way you look up words. I've never looked up that one. But it, see, it doesn't take this long. 880, all right. 880, ah. There are none without sip, voiceless. A-P-H-O-N-O-S. A-P-H-O-N-O-S. We get our word P-H-O-N-E, which means a sound, and place the alpha in front of it. That's the alpha primitive. It means voiceless. There are no languages that are not signified and that don't have a definite sound to them. That's what he's saying. It comes from the Alpha in 5456. Let's go to 5456. I'll define a word on camera, okay? 
54, 56. I don't think I've ever done this before. 54, 56. 54, 56 is the word phone, P-H-O-N-E. It means disclosure. It means to atone or an address or a saying or a language. None of them are without an understanding in a language. Aphone or aphonos means no phone. I can't do without a phone. <laughs> and that's where we get our word phone from. Aphone. Now, isn't that good? We looked one up and showed you how easy it was. Wasn't that easy? In English preaching, man, there would just be a non like signification without any definite meaning. That's right. It has definite meaning. We have to have definition. We have to have instruction. Now, let's go on here. None of them were without a definite meaning is what that means. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. That's what Pentecostalism sounds like because that's what it is. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual. Now, don't put gifts in there because that don't, that's not in there. Of spiritual. You are not living right. You haven't lived right. You have to be fed with milk. You're not grown up. You can't crucify self. I'm having to correct you all the way through this. Paul's never said one word of commendation in this. Then he says, Seek ye that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wait a minute. Look back here. Remember back there in verse 4, He that speaketh in, an, in a foreign language edifies himself. He said, seek to edify the church, to oikodomeo, build up the house of God, not yourself. Now, isn't that what he's saying? It's not really hard if you look at the whole chapter. The only thing is nobody understands that God is not commending the church on every one of these verses. He said, if you speak mysteries, that's wrong. He says the man who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks mysteries. But he doesn't tell them. He tells them through the rest of this chapter, don't speak mysteries. Doesn't he say that? Huh? Isn't that what he's saying? Don't speak a mystery? Then he says, even so ye for as much as you are zealous of spiritual, seek that you may excel to the edifying, the building up of the church, not yourself, by talking in a language that nobody understands. Where? For let him that speaketh in a foreign language prosukum, I bow to the will of God that he may interpret. And the only way you're going to interpret is to know that you know the language of the other people there. Now let me give you the word interpret. It's D-I-E-R. D-I-E-R. Let me write this down. Here's the word interpret. D-I-E-R, I believe that's D-I-E-R, M-E-N-E-U-O, D-I-E-R. I'm just going to give them the reg, just the D-I-E-R, M-E-N-E-U-O. We're not going to give them all the word in. It's M-E-N-E-U-O. And that word, dear menuo, means to explain thoroughly by translation. Now, if you cannot, don't pray that, now, God has given those apostles special abilities in other languages. But if you don't have that ability, and if God has not given you that ability that he gave to the early church, don't you do it. Then he says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, and the word notice, the unknown is not there. If I pray in a foreign language, my spirit prayeth my breath, my pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. My spirit is praying or bowing to the will of God. The word prayer is the word prosuchomai, P-R-O-S-E-U-C-H-O-M-A-I. Prosuchomai comes from pros, meaning to, fall, to motion forward, forward, and E-U-C-H-E. -E, that means to will forward or bow down to the will of God. My voice only, my breath is bowing. But my understanding, he doesn't say, I don't understand. He says, my understanding is not bearing fruit out there with the people. My understanding, what I understand. He didn't say my misunderstanding, did he? Huh. I've got that on my confusion of tongues. Let's turn over to that. I've got that written down over here. Let's turn over here. 
to that. I've got it, my understanding over in, here it is over on page 12 of the Confusion of Tongue Study paper. Page 12. Have you noticed how he's contradicting building up self all the way through here and not speaking clearly? And some men are speaking in unknown tongues. Are they speaking in foreign languages? He's saying, don't do that and don't speak metries and don't build up yourself. Edify the church, not yourself. Prophesy according to the word of God and not your, and not your jibber-jabbering. Of course, what's going on in the, in the so-called Pentecostal movement today is not what they're talking about here. It's ain't it at all. Now, he says, my understanding is unfruitful. On, on page 12, the word understanding is the word N-O-U-S. Now, that word noose comes to the word noia. He's, in fact, let's, let's look through here. On page 12, that my understanding, he doesn't say my misunderstanding. He does not say I don't understand. Now, the Pentecostals say, I don't understand and my spirit's just praying. And this is a heavenly language. No, it's not. That's not what he's talking about. He's, Paul is saying, if I pray in an unknown tongue, a language that nobody here knows, what I am saying is unfruitful to the people are hearing even though I understand. The things I understand is not bearing any fruit to the people listening because they don't know it. That's what he's talking about, and that word understanding is noose, and it means the intellect or the mind. You mean Paul didn't understand his own intellect? The word intellect means to understand. That's what it means. When you look it up in the Webster's, it means to understand. He says, it means the intellect, the mind, or the meaning. What I am meaning and what I am saying, and I understand it, other people don't know what I'm saying. And it's the same word in Luke 24 and 25, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Romans 11, 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Mind is noose, understanding. It comes from the word noia, N-O-I-A, and metanoia. Metanoia means to be turned and then to think differently. And the word noia means to think. And I don't mean I think in the sense of thinking with an opinion. I'm talking about cogitating and to mull over something and to think over something. Paul is saying, my thinking, what I understand and know to be true, is not fruitful because I know what I'm saying, but nobody else knows. And the word noose comes from the word G-I-N-O-S-K-O. And that's the verb form of G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, and that means knowledge. This comes from, gnosis comes from the word noose, or noia, which is a part of, what if he said, my repentance, I've turned and I'm thinking differently, noia, and the meaning that I understand can't get to anybody. He is, Paul is rebuking these people here. And that word gnosko means to perceive. My perception is not bearing any fruit because I'm talking in a foreign language. That's what he's saying. And look over here on page 13. It comes from the word noeo, N-O-I-E-O. That means to exercise the mind, and that's the N-O-I-E-O, metanoia, metanoia, or noeo, comes from noia. And noeo means to exercise the mind or to comprehend. He's saying, my comprehension is not bearing any fruit among the people because nobody here knows the language I'm talking in, or perceiving, or thinking, or understanding. I'm not going to go into hypostasis. And he used the word noeo. Do you not understand that whatsoever entereth the mouth goeth into the belly? And that that word understand is the same word noeo. When he says my understanding, he says the understanding that I have is not bearing any fruit. And all these words for understand in here are the word think. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
He says, what I am thinking is not profitable to anybody here because I understand and God has given me all these abilities to speak in an unknown language because he wants us to get the gospel out to all the civilized world and he's given us this special ability since there are no New Testaments translated to every language that we can hand out. They couldn't hand out the New Testaments here because 1 Corinthians is a part of the New Testament. <laughs> and it's just in the writing is what it is. And of course you get the word noema from that, N-O-E-M-A, N-O-E-M-A, that comes from the word understanding. My understanding is unfruitful. Noema means perception, purpose, the intellect, device, the mind, the thought. Now you got some verses under here that uh, Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, of his understanding, of his thinking, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds. Paul says, my mind, my intellect, my ability to understand and perceive and to think is not... Gosh, I'm not through, am I? Amen. Oh, man. Let's get on further here. Let's read some more of this. Goodness. Whew. I'll come back next week to that spot there. Let's go back over here. Now, let's go here. He says, the things that I understand is unfruitful. It's not bearing any fruit out there among the people. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit... I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. You mean where Paul can understand it? No, he can do that at home or riding down the road in his car or on his camel or whatever he rides in. What he's talking about, when I speak and I sing, I'm going to do it where everybody here can understand. Now, I'm not going to talk in a language where they don't understand. Tim, if, if you're speaking in a foreign language, two people of the foreign, why would you need well, it's not a foreign language to them. Right. It seems like but, but when he's saying glossa... He's saying, if you're speaking in a tongue right now, pray that you'll interpret the Word of God and stop speaking in a tongue. Well, the whole point is this. They had an ability to do this in the first century because right. God gave them the ability to speak in foreign languages because he had a bunch of ignorant guys. And besides that, there were hundreds of dialects. And it's just like Mr... Uh, Angus said, no man could go all over the civilized world and talk in all those languages. It was impossible. So God gave them that language. It was like a verification that what they were saying was the truth. To speak, and they would hear in their gloss of their dialect, like they heard every man in their own dialect when they were born. If, you're, if two of you are speaking in the same foreign language, it's not a foreign language. <laughs> when me and you are discoursing right back and forth here, this is not a foreign language to me and you, but it's a foreign language to people in Germany. Is it? Yeah, so why would they need an interpreter? Because they understood what they were Well, it wasn't, but it wasn't, that's not what it was. They were speaking in foreign languages, and you had dozens of different guys here that had all these different languages they all wanted to stand up and say something in. So it was a foreign language to them. That's like at the UN, where they have those headphones. That's right. And one man's talking in English, and it's being translated. It's being translated in, in all of those languages. All of those that's it. Languages. That's, the end that's the whole point of it. Let's read the rest of this, because I don't have much time. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen? <laughs> or let it be, or so be it. At thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. How is he going to give thanks when he don't even understand what you're saying? What he's talking about, they had a problem there, and they all want to get up and stand up and show off and edify themselves. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God, I speak with glossa, foreign languages more than you all, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, with what I so my understanding will go out there and get to you and you will understand it with my understanding that then that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a gloss that nobody understands. That's what this is talking about. And they had an ability to speak in a gloss when it was necessary in all of these languages, and that is not Pentecostalism. Now he says, Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be children, but in understanding be men, be mature, be grown up. 
in the law it is written now I've gone through this and I'm going to go back to this this is quoted from the 28th chapter of Isaiah in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet for all that will they not hear me saith the Lord now that's quoted let's look at it in 28th chapter 28th chapter of Isaiah 28th chapter I'm going to go back to it one more time that's quoted in the 28th chapter. Why is it quoted? Because Israel turned away from God and went after all these idols. And he said, who's going to teach Israel? Who's going to teach my people in the ninth verse of chapter 28? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Isaiah is talking about Israel being scattered because they have made a contract and agreement with hell. Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And when he's talking about hell, he's talking about Tophet, southeast of Jerusalem, where they burnt their children in the fires. He says, who will he make to understand doctrine? Instruction. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. I'm going to cut Israel down with the Assyrians with the Babylonians, with the Persians, it's going to be a little at a time. With the Grecians, with the Romans, and then he's going to pass them from nation to nation for 2,600 years, and they will learn. And then he says, and this is quoted, this is where this is quoted from, for with stammering lips in another tongue will I speak to this people. And the word stammering is that word laeg, L-A-E-G. It means foreign language. And what is the foreign language that God's going to talk to Israel? The foreign language is the whips of the Assyrians. It's the Assyrian chariot wheels as they come in and name the second chapter to cut them down for turning to tree worship and celebrating the Christ Mass for, for worshiping Hercules. That's why he's saying, I'm going to talk to this people with men of other tongues and other lips. That word stammering is laeg, L-A-E-G, laeg. It means a foreign language. That is the Old Testament word equivalent to glossa. He said, this is the whole purpose of the glossa, the foreign languages. I'm going to talk to Israel with men of stammering lips and another tongue. Tongue. <coughs> <coughs> That word tongue is loshan. It means to speak a language, a talker. Will he speak to this people to whom he said this is the rest? He said, you'll go to Canaan. You'll rest in Canaan wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. Well, that's what he's saying over here in 1 Corinthians. Now, if you're going to teach 1 Corinthians... About the gloss, you're going to have to speak this, and that's what he says here. I flipped away from it. Y'all excuse me. Now, here it is. First Corinthians, let's read it again. Let's compare it, okay? He says it here in 14. He says, it is in the law it is written. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Read it over here, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue... Will he speak to this people to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing? Yet they would not hear. That's where it's quoted from. What is it talking about? It's talking about Ephraim there in verse 3. Ephraim is northern Israel. Uh, verse 3 of chapter 28, the crown of pride. The drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot. They're drunk with the wine of Babylon. Pride, self. They're worshiping Venus, the tree goddess, and Hercules, Baal. And he, that's the whole purpose of the tongues, was to get the gospel or the message to the Gentiles. That's what he's saying. Let's back, back to 1 Corinthians 14. He says, wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Glossa is for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. Wait a minute, why? Because he says prophesy edifies the church in verse 4. And we're to excel and edify the church in verse 12. And we're never to edify the self in verse 4 by speaking in an unknown language because we speak mysteries and it's not clear what is being taught 
and you don't know the sound of the pipe or the harp. Do you see that? This whole chapter is a condemnation of Corinth. And he says, Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves to the believer that builds up the church. Tongues were for one sign. To them that believe not, there's only one sign to the unbeliever in Matthew 16, 1 through 4. A wicked, the scribes and the Pharisees came to Jesus seeking a sign. They were seeking a Simeon, same word here, and they said there's, he said there's only one sign, and that's the sign of the prophet Jonah. And what was that? That Jonah was resurrected from the belly of the fish in Matthew, the 12th chapter. Look at that one more time, and then we'll quit. Here's the only sign of the unbeliever. Matthew 6 and Matthew 12. You've got to mark that right beside that verse there in 1 Corinthians 14. Matthew 6, Matthew 12. Now, this is not the only time I'm going to go through 1 Corinthians 14. I haven't gone through 1 Corinthians 14 in a long time. I don't think since any of the people here have been here. Matthew 6, uh, Matthew 12, and Matthew 16. Let's look at Matthew 16. Tongues are for a sign to them that believe not. Prophesying is to edify the church. Never is a man supposed to edify himself. We're to excel in the edifying of the church, build up the church, oikodomeo. And what does that is agape. That means to have the knowledge and do it. And everybody has to understand what's going on. And he says here in verse 1 of chapter 16 of Matthew, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a Simeon from heaven. Same word. Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but them that believe not. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the weather, the face of the sky. But why is it that you cannot, but he says, but can you not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Why are they adulterous? Because God was married to Israel. He said, I've given Israel a bill of divorcement. Because they went after other gods and laid under every green tree, the evergreen, the Christ mass tree. And he said, there's only one sign given to you. He said, I've divorced Israel. God divorced his wife. Now, you say, I don't like that. Well, then you're going to have to read the third chapter of Jeremiah. That's what he did. And there shall be no sign be given but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And look over there in Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. So therefore, the sign of the prophet Jonah is the only sign to the unbeliever. And the only sign to the unbeliever, that's what the tongues were used for. So when you find out what the sign of the prophet Jonas is, then you find out what the sign to the unbeliever. And he says here in Matthew 12, 38, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas, here it is, here's his sign. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be at three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas after his resurrection. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So the only sign, the only Simeon, glosses for a sign to them that believe not. And tongues are for sign to them that believe not. That's the foreign languages. And the only sign to the unbeliever is resurrection and the preaching of repentance. That's all. And that's all the sign you get anymore. God said, you don't get all these miracles anymore, Israel. You, you got ten signs in Egypt. You got ten plagues. This showed you. You got the, you got the hail and you got the flies and the lice and you got... Uh, the water turned to blood, but you don't get that no more. You had a cloud by day and a fire by night to lead you, and your shoes didn't wear out, and your feet didn't swell up, but you don't get that no more either because you rejected me. And I've called my people by another name, New Testament church. We are to speak words that can be easily understood. And you know what these Baptist preachers, and I give the Baptists a hard time because I felt like they were a great stronghold of Christianity for so long. 
but I give them a hard time. They are preaching a confusion of language, and they're preaching words that are difficult to understand. They have a mixed religion, and they are preaching a foreign language because nobody knows what they're saying, and the English language is such a prostitute language, it sells out, and you can't understand what's being said in the pulpits of America because nobody knows the definitions of these words, do they? You know what they're preaching in the churches in America? They're preaching a foreign language. That's what they're doing, aren't they? If you don't know that prayer means to bow to the will of God, it don't mean to ask God for what you want, and predestinate means to pre-bow inside the border of Israel. We know here, we define words here. We teach the people here to understand very clearly and not to, if I stand up here, isn't that what some preacher does when he stands in the pulpit and says, yes, brother, God bless you. Amen, it's so wonderful that the sky is blue and isn't God's word beautiful and they just say all these goofy things. And when you leave, you get to the parking lot and you say, what did the preacher talk about? Gosh, I can't tell. I don't remember. Are y'all going to be able to tell what we talked about tonight when you leave here? Huh? You're not going to be able to forget it, are you? Me and this guy used to go to a church and we used to try to remember by the time we got to the parking lot what the preacher had talked about. Y'all going to remember Glossa and Dialects and you're going to remember the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, aren't you? That's what this is about. If you'll notice, there's a juxtaposition when he says prophesying in unknown tongue, those are clashing with one another. He says, if you prophesy, you better know the language and you better have it interpreted. I'll come back next week. Uh, there's several other verses there in 1 Corinthians 4. Well, let me read the rest of that. I might as well, hadn't I? Let's, let me read the rest of this because... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read it because I, I wanted to... Let's just read 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying... And that means to prophesy in a language they can understand and have it interpreted. Serveth not for them that believe, not for them which believe. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with unknown languages, and there come in those that are unlearned. That word is idiotes. Idiotes. I had it written up here at the side. Idiotes, and they're all idiots. They're unlearned. Or unbelievers, will they not say that that ye are crazy, mad. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, and when he's saying prophesy, he's talking about interpreting and having it done in the right kind of language. He is convinced of all, he is judged of all, you've heard the word and you're judged by the word of God. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God, but he won't do it if he don't understand what's going on. And report that God is in you of a truth. The word truth is aletheia. It means to rip the cover off. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a foreign language, and hath a revelation you want to stand up and show off? Hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. Of what? Self? No. The church in verse 12. The church up there in verse 4. Not self in verse 3 and not mysteries of verse 2. This is an indictment against him. If any man speak in an unknown glossa, let it be by two or at most by three. Now, what in the world is Paul Crouch doing getting on TV and that stupid R.W. Schambach and going, Shandala Mastala Kandai? And they're doing it all over the world so all these people can hear and they're going jibber jabber, jibber jabber, jibber jabber. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three or an unknown glossa, foreign language, and that by course let one interpret. And if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. It don't mean if there's somebody who will stand up and say, Yea, I say unto thee, I am thy God and thou art my people. I'm a good interpreter, ain't I? And if thou wilt be my people, I will be thy God, and thou shalt be unto me a people precious. And thou shalt be my people, and I will be unto thee, and be with thee, and give you all the stuff you want. What a bunch of baloney. People say, you shouldn't say that. Yes, I should. 
because the world is corrupt. The world is preaching an unknown language. They have a confusion of tongues. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Keep your mouth shut if you don't know that somebody is there that can interpret. And if you can't interpret, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn. Manthano. It comes from the word mathetuo. And Jesus said, the only way you can be my disciple, my mathetes, is by taking your cross and dying to self. And that's what you got. And all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author. The word the author, is it actually says God is not confusion. But of peace, irene, it means to bring together in one, as in all churches of the saints, and when it says, let your women keep silence in the churches, that don't mean be quiet. That don't mean teach. That means to keep a low profile. It does not mean don't ever talk. Whether preachers believe that or not, I'll get into that one night. I taught, in that, I taught on that here some time back, and I'm not going to go into it now. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. When there are men there to preach the message, that's what's supposed to be preached. But if you're on a deserted island and a woman is the only person there that knows anything about the Bible and she's got ten men and they're all stupid, you better let her preach. <laughs> and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands to own, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church and is talking about usurping authority in the sanctuary over the men. What came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with languages, but he say, you've got to have an interpreter and it has to be there so that it will edify and build up the body of Christ, not self. Let all things be done decently and in order, not Pentecostal style. And I thought I'd just stick that in, or not some of these Baptist style. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for an understanding of what this is, Lord. That it is an indictment that the churches, that men stand in the pulpits, and they're not interpreting by defining the words. And that's what's wrong. Men don't understand the truth. And these Pentecostals have taken your precious words and destroyed it. And these people are not Pentecostals, God. They're, they are too afraid to approach the real truth by defining these things. God, help us to understand and continue in this word, in this work. And help us to continue to divine. That's what we're doing, Lord, when we define the words. We are interpreting for the people and telling them what these things mean because in this old heathen foreign language called English, this pagan language that has no meaning. People can't understand what you meant. We truly have a gloss of foreign language that men don't understand called the English language. Lord, help us to rip the cover off and interpret these words. And we will praise you and glorify you in Christ's name. Amen.